Hopkins. I'm the director of expedition photography for Limblad Expeditions. I have only been doing it for 29 years. It's a part-time job. I'm still doing it. And in 1990, when I took my first voyage, that was also the first year I had an image published with National Geographic. So it's been quite a road that has come together with Lindblad and National Geographic being together. You guys got all, you got everyone pick up one of those. And I'm going to talk about Baja. So if you haven't yet, you haven't yet um, registered for that. So optic, I mean, I plan my year about around this, and then uh, as a photographer, the one thing about being a photographer is it's kind of a lonely pursuit when you're out shooting. And so I think in one way we plan these meetings so the photographers can come together and, and, uh, and visit. The problem is we come from different time zones. So after my harrowing, uh, taxi ride from the Newark airport the other night during rush hour. And then I was going to meet with uh, Cece Brimberg for dinner. She had just come from Fiji. She slept for 13 hours, so we didn't get together for dinner. And then I was going to meet with Ira yesterday at 1, but it turned out my phone was on Peru time where I came from, so I didn't get to see Ira. So I'm glad to be here on time. And it's an uh, exciting time. So if I hit this, will it start playing my talk? Oh, there we go. So the National Geographic fleet of ships. It's an exciting time to be a photographer in this digital world. I grew up with film, started 4x5, and I would never go back to film, even though I love pulling out the old frames on, on a light table and looking at them. But it's also an exciting time to be a traveler. So I've got to start with talking about the Lindblad ships and the fact that we go from pole to pole, which does make you bipolar if you go both ways. So that's the National Geographic Explorer on, on a typical day in Antarctica with flat, calm conditions. Uh, these ships are the perfect, how many folks have been on a trip on a ship-based expedition? Because well, we're talking about the best places in the world to go by ship. They're great platforms for photography. Uh, we have a second ship called the Orion, and we're building a third ocean-going blue water ship we call. It's going to be called the Endurance. But uh, I am, uh, I'm addicted to ice, and I'm on my way to Norway to go up to Svalbard and over to Greenland and down to Iceland, which is mostly green. But uh, so that's, that's what drives me in photography, is going to these wild places. Uh, I just want to show one short little video about what we do, if it runs. And we need sound for this. There. Nailed it. Take a picture here. It's really fun. Tell the story of your voyage. What is the moment? Look, we can get this close. Wait for the moment. Oh, right off your front. Access a world that usually goes very much unnoticed. I love that I can take that knowledge and, and give it to the guests. We're looking for those key moments of the trip that really define an expedition. So I think the uh, acoustics in here are a little, little challenging. Um, so I wanted to talk about this, this, this image, the lead image for the, um, for the optic, because this is southeast Alaska. And when people who have not seen glaciers see this blue ice in photos, they think it's not real. They think it's Photoshop, but it's not. The ice calves from the glaciers that come down off the, uh, the ice fields along the coast range. And each one is a, an, a work of art itself, a sculpture in itself. Now, you can, you can lick the icebergs. Your tongue doesn't stick, but um, it's water that's hundreds of years old as snowfall. And we're always setting up shots to show to show the place. And, and you know, we're talking about making images that matter and how to make them in this conference. And images that matter for a lot of things that I do, one is the image needs to make you want to go there. But two, I'm going to be telling you about a love story about Baja, California. Images that matter also about the places that you care and you want to make people care about those places that, that you love. It's fun seeing friends in the audience. 
Um, so that, that's, uh, so the image that we used was, was cropped from this one, a zodiac in southeast Alaska with the ice. So the world's a big place. And uh, Lindblad and National Geographic Fleet, we're up to, uh, well, we're building the eighth ship. And with the charters, we have over 12 ships. So these are the trips that I've been make, taking for the, uh, about the last decade. Again, I've got almost 30 years of travel. And when I'm out, I'm always looking for images, again, that want to make you be there. And that can, are shot for covers. So when you're shooting for, and you guys know this, when you're shooting for publication, you're thinking about the printed page. You're thinking leaving room. You're shooting a little looser. Back in the film days, we didn't think about shooting to crop. You wanted that frame perfect, right? And now, cropping is not illegal, but you should be thinking about it. So doors off over Baja, California. You ready to go on a little expedition? We're going to fly a little bit, and I'm going to tell you about Baja. How many people have been to Baja, California? It is in Mexico, and it's just south of Alto California, or northern, or upper California. So Baja means lower California. It's a part of Mexico, and it's this beautiful, beautiful peninsula. And this is a love story, because I first went there in the 80s as a geology student from Northern Arizona University, and I saw my first whale, and I saw my first dolphins in the wild, and it changed everything to know that, you know, on this blue planet that's mostly ocean, that there's these amazing creatures out there, and they're curious about us. I wouldn't be doing myself a, a good favor if I didn't tell you, because I'm a geologist, how Baja got there. You've heard of the San Andreas Fault system, separating, pulling apart California. Well, already down in Baja, California, it's been pulled apart. So this peninsula is on the Pacific plate, moving to the northwest, rifting apart North America and leaving this big gash that's deep water, has upwelling of currents, and that's why it's one of the most productive seas in the world for marine mammals, birds, and fishing. It's also one of the most beautiful places in the world because it's a desert. It's this beautiful desert environment. And Baja has actually more um, endemic um, animals and endemic plants, so plants and animals that occur nowhere else, has more than Galapagos, but Darwin wasn't there, so Baja is not as famous. Um, but in this big gash comes a third of the whale species of, of whales and dolphins, of marine mammals, including whale sharks, including the charismatic humpback whales that breach and jump and throw their tails about because they're courting each other in Baja. They're courting and then also giving birth, and, th and they're not feeding there. It's all about social interaction. The second largest whale is there, the fin whale. This is one of the shots from the air. Blue whales are there. This is the fluke against the, uh, the mountainous. Remember, this peninsula has been torn off in North America and tilted to give you this mountainous landscape. Killer whales, pilot whales, everybody's favorite, the sea lions. The Cal oh, well, unless you live where you have a dock. Uh, the California sea lions are there, and you can go swimming with them, like in Galapagos. They come up and they check you out. But it's the dolphins that challenge you. Back in the film days, uh, I would say, okay, here come the dolphins. I'm going to shoot a whole roll of only dolphins. Remember that? 36 frames? Well, I'm telling you, you know, if you have any kind of uh, addictive personality when you start photographing dolphins, because if you see it in the viewfinder, you usually have missed it. They happen so fast when they come up. So you just got to keep shooting because you shoot a lot of splashes. The perfect conditions where you've got no ripples, you can use a polarizer. And now with our modern cameras, ISO, that whole equation of ISO, even shooting at low ISO, many of us now are shooting in manual, setting our f stop, setting our shutter speed and then letting the ISO fluctuate, right? And I find that I shoot at lower ISOs when I do that, even though I'm you know, trying to shoot at a thousandth of a second to stop the action, or two thousandth of a second when you've got this super pod uh, going by the ship. You can see I'm addicted. This will be the last dolphin for a while. 
um, and rays, these mobular rays that glide below. So the, the C there just, and these guys jump. So you want to frustrate yourself because they give no warning. Try to photograph leaping rays. Pre-focus can help. Having cameras that can shoot 12 frames a second help or shoot video. And then there's times when they all come together in feeding frenzies. And then there are those peaceful moments, the squadron of, of uh, pelicans going by at sunrise or when we're on shore at sunrise or sunset on one of the desert islands, this is Isla Santa Catalina. Here's one of the endemic, this is the bujum tree, this crazy tree, it's not a cactus, it's a tree. And they, do the, they get into these kind of strange shapes and they only occur in the Baja Peninsula and a few other places in the Baja area. And then some of the reptiles, the spiny-tailed iguana, cac, uh, uh, spiny -tailed iguana that climb the cactus at about 10 o'clock every morning and eat the flowers of the cardone. And believe it or not, they fly. They leap between cacti. And so you've got to be ready for that. I think, Luisa, you got that shot. I walked away. I wasn't patient and jumped. I'm like, oh, now, I'm, now I have to get it on another cactus. But then waking up, I love Baja because of the light, the desert light. And I like clouds. I mean, you guys are photographers. The last thing you want is a perfect, clear sky postcard day. You want clouds for, for that atmospheric effect. But if you get up early or stay out late, so sunrise or sunset, you get that beautiful warm light. And then you can shoot beyond twilight. So I don't know if you've fallen in love with Baja yet, but um, we're going to keep going because I've been working with conservation groups down there because Baja California is a desirable place. It has beautiful beaches. And if you were to compare Baja, which is 800 miles long, the peninsula, to the U.S. California and the look at the coastline and the development, Baja, it, Cabo, you've heard of Cabo San Lucas. I mean, that's kind of like the sacrifice zone, hotel after hotel after hotel. But if you were to venture outside of there, you'd see that there are these vast expanses of coastline. Along the Baja Peninsula on the west coast, there's a place called Magdalena Bay, and it's a huge barrier island. Beaches that go for 30, 40 miles with not one structure. You know, imagine that. So here's one of those beaches in Isla Santa Margarita. And the upwelling of currents brings these pelagic crabs and whales and turtles and other things are offshore eating them. They wash up on shore and then all the seabirds come in. Beaches that are just littered with shells. I should say adorned with shells. And of course, we don't collect when we go there because then they wouldn't be adorned with as many shells. Whale bones that have washed up for whatever reason. And then there are these mangrove line channels, these estuaries behind this barrier island. And this is where the gray whales come. California gray whales are born in Mexico. Mexico was the first country to establish a whale refuge back in the 30s of the last century because they were being hunted out. And it was actually American whalers that, that discovered these areas and they were just stocked full with, with gray whales, mothers and calves, and they'd come in. Well, it turns out that someone's sending me something. It turns out that um, they've forgiven us and they're friendly. They're coming up to our boats, and this behavior started in the 70s. So these gray whales, mother and calf, and this is a mother underneath the calf. The calf is on top. Now, imagine giving birth to a, like a two-ton, 15-foot animal that then is going to gain you know, 100 pounds a day. But this is what happens. She pushes this calf up to be touched. Or, This is also friendly behavior. This photo, though, has never in, ended up in a brochure. Um, she loves feeling the boat, so she's getting kind of playful, and she had done it to our boat, and I warned the other boat. I said, be careful, she's going to push up the boat. There's Michael Nolan giving last rites. So I've got this housing that's a dome port, an Aquatech sport housing. It looks like a big whale eye, and I swear, they come in and they check it out. 
they'll swim right, the calf will swim right up to it and look right in there. But this eye has a motion. This, this whale was born in Mexico and it's gonna swim with its mom all the way to the Arctic Ocean, all the way up to the Bering and Chukchi Seas to feed, because they feed on the crustaceans and euphausids and things in the mud up in the Arctic, if you can believe that. So that's the background for seeing this. So I'd been going to Baja for 20 some odd years. We had made landings on this beautiful sand spit and then we arrive and there's a hotel. This hotel complex just happens to be right off the shore of La Paz on a barrier island. Now do you see any wetlands on this island? I mean wetlands, it's, there are environmental laws even in, I mean, Mexico has very strong environmental laws as well. But like in the US, not all environmental laws are, are enforced and money talks. Just offshore this hotel complex is where the nursery for the whale sharks are, which is becoming an industry to, to swim with these amazing whale sharks. And there are researchers that I worked with that are studying and studying these whale sharks to try to create corridors where there'll be rules and how fast boats can go. So when I saw this hotel, I realized, okay, I've got to use my images to help conservation groups, Mexican conservation groups, U.S. conservation groups, tell the story of what's happening. And I'm not the only photographer doing this. So I set out on the great Baja road trip with my friend Alberto, who is my guide. Uh, he's a Mexican citizen, actually a dual citizen. And we started at the border. Spoiler alert, there is a wall. Um, actually, this wall is a very nice wall because wildlife can go through it. And that's the problem with walls, is that wildlife, it impedes wildlife, not only human traffic, but, but um, the wildlife. Now, you can imagine, and you can't, you can't fault anyone for this, that you, know, you own land on this beautiful beach and development's starting to happen, and you, know, you want something to happen. But you have to be careful what you ask for. Now, uh, this, this development was never built. And I don't know the full story, but um, American investors lost about $250 million on a development that did not get built in Tijuana. Others have gotten built and have, and we're talking about mega developments, and I'm not anti-development. I live on a golf course, I play golf course, a golf, but do we need more golf courses, especially in a desert environment? I would submit no. And these mega developments, they already exist and occupancy is not 100%. They use a lot of water and it's a desert environment. There's a human toll in, in how these places are, are built. And then there's other aspects of development and, and growing populations in places like the shark fishing. We had some adventures um, when we were doing our investigations, like meeting the Mexican army. And um, I asked if I, I could take a picture and they said no. So I said, well, I'm like Mark Thiessen. I'm a, I'm, I'm a photojournalist. So I shot from the hip, forgot my flash was on. <laughs> Rookie mistake, we didn't get shot. Thank God, we had, we had, that's when we had also a female Mexican guide with us. But this, this shot though shows what what's in store for some of these places. La Vibera, the first sign is this small Mexican fishing town. Expats from the States have been coming there for years to fish. Well, it's gonna be called Cabo Riviera after the resort is, golf resort is built. And it's right next door to a pristine national park offshore called Cabo Pulmo. So it turns out a lot of Baja is for sale, and that has to do with some of the laws that were changed about ownership of land, and also the interest of North Americans to come south in the winter. So this story from our land trip was in, in, in uh, National Geographic Traveler magazine. So the groups that I was working with wanted me to do an aerial survey, and this is the doors off part. There's a group called Lighthawk, these conservation pilots, they donate their time, and sometimes they're planes, and if we can buy the fuel, we can go flying. 
So we proposed this and we were able to raise money to go flying and we flew, we met the plane because it was coming from uh, Central America in Cabo San Lucas and flew crisscross the peninsula all the way up to San Diego. We had doors but they were off almost the whole time. And I'm invincible when I'm doors off. Actually, if I have my camera, I'm invincible. As soon as I put it down where we had to go A to B, I'm like uh, white knuckle. I worked with my friend Jeff Litton, who was shooting video. He made short films that the conservation groups used on their websites. And we flew with this pilot. This is very interesting. He was a, an engineer for the Army Corps of Engineers, and his project was to take water out of the Colorado River for Tucson and Phoenix. Built that um, project there in Arizona. And ever since he retired, he's been working with conservation groups to try to put back water in the Colorado River. So Land's End, you know about Land's End at Cabo San Lucas, this beautiful rock formation? Well, it turns out very big ships come in there three, four at a time, and it's a protected area. It's not managed that way. So that influx of huge ships, of course, sets up this conflict with, with the locals, of course, which, you know, tourism can save places, and it is saving places like Galapagos places in the Arctic, places in the Antarctic, but it can also, if it's not done correctly, really impact places like putting a hotel on one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. This is Lover's Beach that Steinbeck wrote about. Over along East Cape where the airport's located, and someone once told me that my talk is like, it's like a roller coaster ride. I'll depress you and then I'll tell you the, 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 the good news, you know. So here's this estuary that's protected Right next door to this estuary is this little town called La Playita. Another one of these little fishing towns, and look what happened. A marina was dug into the coast a kilometer that separated the town, divided the town, people were for it, people were against it, because here's the plan. But hang on, let me see if it'll play. I guess not. Uh, the animation's not playing. Or maybe, it, there it goes. And remember, I play golf. Five golf courses. Now, it would be okay if this was the only project, but there's 45 of these type developments proposed. Luckily, 2008 came along, so that, you know, the recession kind of threw it back. But the problem is, is right next door to some of these proposed developments, is a national park. And this national park is the good news because it was once being overfished. The locals asked for a national park. It was granted and now it is the poster child. In the last 20 years, the sharks, the fish have come back and now it's this nursery and the fishing in the area has improved because there's a protected area. So that's the message is that nature is resilient and if you, even with the things that we have done, because 90% of the sharks in the world are gone. But if we start protecting these areas, things come back. So if we can tell these stories, make images that matter, you know, and these are beautiful places. Look at this coastline. Look at the reef structures. So this is a, a hot spot for diving, a hot spot for wildlife. But what's proposed right next door? The Cabo Cortez Marina and a city of 30,000 right next door to the National Park. Well, even right next door to that, there already is a marina dug in to the coast, just like that other one. There are environmental laws about digging in wetlands, digging in the shoreline, but this marina was built. Of course, it has great impacts. The local communities are divided. The promise of jobs, you know, it's the same story. But there are success stories. Other marinas have been proposed, like here near Espiritu Santo, in the archipelago there, Bahia Balandra. You just have to blink once to, to picture a hotel and marina and a golf course in this beautiful bay. It was stopped. It has now been protected. The local people of La Paz in Mexico in concert with environmental groups. So this beautiful bay, this mangrove here, slow shutter speed at sunset will be hopefully forever wild like this and so people can come and swim. So flying over the mountains, this is when it was probably the, the scariest because <laughs> there's no place to land should you have an issue. And I was told about this perched wetland up in the Sierra de la Giganta and we found it when it was green. 
imagine every cougar, every bighorn sheep, all the wildlife that would come to this wetland perched in the mountains. So water resources are very precious, and that's why developments that drill wells, a lot of developments now, they'll use um, uh, desal desalination plants. That's another story. But this wetland was just beautiful, and just below it, not far from there, is that Loretto Bay development where they, they have deep wells. So th there's a balance that has to be maintained there. So on this first trip, we ended up near San Diego. We photographed, was told to go out and photograph this group of islands called Islas Coronados because the group Wild Coast out of San Diego, they were working with the Mexican government to establish all the islands along the Pacific coast of the Baja Peninsula as a protected area, as a biosphere reserve. And that was announced last year, and so that has happened. So that's more good news. And then we crossed the wall and landed in San Diego and got laughed at when we didn't have a door by the customs officials. But they didn't search the plane. So then after, uh, in 2014, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Odile, that um, was class four, hit Cabo San Lucas. The conservation group called me up and said, can you get down there to show the impacts? Because now I have the before. And so we were able to raise money in about 24 hours to go down there, get a plane, and there we were. Well, this isn't our plane. But when we landed in La Paz, we left from Tucson, flew down the coast, landed in La Paz, planes were still upside down from this hurricane. When we got down to Cabo San Lucas, this was the new air terminal down there. We got kicked out of here like three times trying to film and shoot. Remember Land's End? This is all the sand that was at Land's End in May 2013 when I shot it. May 24, or September 2014, sand is gone. The message there is things change with these big storms and if you build too close to the coastline, you can have consequences like that hotel. Remember the hotel on the beach I was telling you about? Well, it's not the only hotel, but that red line leading up the screen there is what's called the federal zone and you can't build below that because you're in the high tide, in the storm surge. Well, that storm comes along and before, you can see all those beautiful walls that they're building there for their terraces and things. After the storm, all that was just torn apart. Um, some of the hotels in, in Cabo did not open for a year after this storm. And remember the estuary. After the storm, look how that barrier island changed. Another message, photos that matter, to show that you build on a barrier island, they're meant to move with the storm. New channels do break through. So even if you have a house on stilts in the wrong spot, you could be in trouble. That little Puerto Los Cabos that was built into the, the coastline, you can see the beautiful little marina in front of the White Hotel. That was destroyed, and a lot of their breakwaters were, were moved up around by this storm. I mean, we're talking about a high-energy coastline where you probably shouldn't have built that structure. Same thing, oh, remember La Rivera before. Some of these lots here were initially selling for a million dollars on sand. I don't. Hopefully no one paid that price because a lot of the sand is gone or when the floods came, it turns out this marina was built right in a flood zone. And uh, when I was doing my investigations, I went into the, the real estate office and I said, I'm a little concerned. I'm thinking about buying, but I heard that this is a flood zone and how the town was moved. And so what happens when there's a big storm? She said, oh, don't worry about that. We have it all engineered. The floods will go underneath the marina. I don't know how you do that. So all the sand came into the marina, so they would have to dig it back out. So I need to do another update, I think, to go down and see what's happened now. You know, remember the Sierra de la Giganta, this desert area before the hurricane? Now it looks like Costa Rica. And I was, went up in this area to photograph because in this area there's a gold mine, an open pit gold mine proposed in the watershed for La Paz. And I don't know of any, I mean, I'm a geologist, right? You know, mining and oil, but I don't know of any open pit mining that has been environmentally sound that hasn't disturbed water resources. Another shot of Sierra de la Giganta before the storm, after the storm. This is like two weeks after a storm, just boom, green. That perched wetland, here's a photo of it when it's dry, became a lake. So again, all the wildlife up in that area, what a bounty for them. 
So that area now has been protected as a biosphere reserve. More good news. And I'm going to end up with Isla Rasa. So there's this little flat island, kind of in the midriff section, the middle section of the Sea of Cortez. And you see all that white? That's not snow. That's guano. That's bird droppings. That was mine. So that shows you how many birds were there historically. The guano was so thick that it was mined for phosphate and shipped to San Francisco for fertilizer and gunpowder. But when miners come ashore, and also the eggs were collected for bakeries all up and down the Baja Peninsula. But when people come ashore, also rodents come ashore. So there were rats that impacted the birds. But 30 years now of protection, the birds are back on years where the birds go out and eat the anchovies and sardines in the Gulf. So on years where the fish are there, the birds nest. And we'll see if this little video plays. And it is deafening. So we go explore there. And the birds come in March. And then they leave after they have their eggs. So by June, it's quiet again. So seeing these elegant terns and hearman's gulls by the thousands, there's nearly a half million birds on this one little island. And you can fill your frame with just elegant turns, you know, the bounty of wildlife. So this is a success story. You protect an area, you eradicate invasive species, whether it's man or rodents, and the birds come back and they court and they court and they come back in great numbers and they feed their young and they enjoy the sunsets. I love birds, but I'm really there for the whales. And so some of the other work I've been doing now is uh, raising, helping um, a group called the Maui Whale Trust raise money for research on humpback whales. So each year now, and I know it's tough work, I go to Maui in February, and we watch and photograph whales. So if anyone's interested in coming down and helping with research, making a donation, come see me. And this shot was for my mom. I was strapped in, but I could, it was shorter when I was in the plane. I wouldn't have dangled. And there was a clip so I could get out had we had to ditch. So thank you for your attention. Enjoy Optic.